button. Don't be alarmed. You can just hit OK to that. I will be admitting folks in the background. I want to welcome uh, members of our board. Our president, Chad Dyer, and our vice president, Adam Tate, is here today, along with all of you. Uh, special thanks to everyone that is on the senator staff. We are greatly appreciative of their time and their effort, um, and most importantly, appreciative of the senator's time. Today, the Senator is going to talk to us a little bit about his legislative agenda for 2023, some of the accomplishments from 2022, and the importance of home, Homeless Persons Memorial Day, which is actually December 21st, 2022. So we are extremely excited to welcome the Senator. When the Senator's on, I am going to spotlight the Senator. What that means is that you will not be able to see each other, but you will be able to see the Senator. So don't be alarmed. Everything with your tech is working properly. The Senator is going to speak with us for about 40 minutes today, uh, and then we will disconnect today's call. So again, I greatly appreciate each and every one of you for being here, for taking part in the Inclusion Talk series, and we're so fortunate to have Senator Scott Weiner be our final speaker for 2022. I believe the Senator just entered the room we have a lot I'm here. Of Thank you. Yes, there we are, Senator. We are so excited to welcome you. What I am going to do is I'm going to make you a co-host, Senator, and then I'm going to spotlight you or put focus mode on you. So I'm going to mute myself. I'm going to turn this over to you. And Senator, can you see me and everyone okay? Yeah, I can see you. Okay, perfect. So let's see. Let me make sure that we have you here. All right, everyone, thank you all so much. I'm going to close this out. And then, Senator, the floor is yours. Great. Uh, thank you so much for having me today. I really appreciate it. Um, and I, uh, first of all, I just want to say thank you to Compass for everything you do uh, to help uh, people who are in the in the most dire of straits, and particularly families. Uh, I I can't even imagine um, what it would be like uh, to be um, have a family. It's, it's tough enough to be homeless, but to be homeless with kids, I just it's. It's almost unimaginable and it's a, a moral failure of our society that we allow that to exist. It should not exist at all. And uh, the work that you do is absolutely life-saving and I'm just deeply appreciative. Um, we are, uh, um, in addition to the great work that's happening locally and I really just wanna praise our mayor uh, for her leadership in supporting efforts to help transition people off the streets. Uh, and to support the investment in affordable housing. Um, continuing in a line of mayors with Mayor Lee, Mayor Newsom, et cetera, uh, we have strong leadership in the city. We're working hard at the state level to try to do our share. In the last few budgets, we have dramatically increased uh, our investment in affordable housing to try to uh, really support the efforts of local communities uh, to create that housing. Unlike our last governor, who I, I loved Governor Brown, but he was a little bit of a hard sell on housing investments. Uh, governor Newsom is not a hard sell. He believes it. He's uh, he's always there. We never have to fight with him about this in the budget. We play with him about other things, but not about this. Uh, we all agree. And so we re really, really, really uh, ramped up our investment in affordable housing. It's going to be a little more challenging to sustain that this year because we are expecting a, a potentially significant budget deficit, um, but we're going to continue to to really try to focus and prioritize that life-saving investment. Uh, we're also focused on making policy changes to try to address the root cause of homelessness, which is the lack of available and affordable housing. Uh, for many, many years, probably going on 50, we have made it so hard to build new housing in California. Our housing production has absolutely collapsed over the last few decades. Uh, due to uh, you know nimbyism and just restrictive zoning and uh, approval processes that take forever and ever uh, and make everything more expensive, uh, and that has pushed everything everyone down, uh, and and that means the people at the bottom of the economic ladder are pushed off that ladder entirely. And we know that we have so many low income renters 
who are at risk of becoming the next wave of homeless people and homeless families. Uh, and we need to, you know, while we do all the triage of investing in shelter and transitional housing and, and supportive housing, uh, we need to keep people stabilized in their homes with uh, more rent subsidies and, and, and renter protections. But then we need to solve the root cause and to build a lot more housing and, and make it a lot easier. Um, so we're, uh, uh, by the first bill that I introduced in the legislature, SB 35, uh, which was enacted in 20, we passed it in 2017. And my goal next year is to remove the sunset on that bill, um, has been a huge boon for affordable housing in particular. In San Francisco alone, I think we're up to like 3,000 units that have been approved under SB 35. It, it completely streamlines the process, takes CEQA and discretion out of it, and just provides you gotta just give the permit quickly. Bridge Housing, the largest affordable housing builder in the state, told us that because of SB 35, uh, their average um, permitting time was reduced from seven years on average to four months on average. Uh, and so that has been a success and we wanna build on that success. Uh, this past year, my colleague, Assemblymember Buffy Wicks, authored AB 2011, which will allow and facilitate the conversion of underutilized commercial uh, land uh, to housing, uh, which is fantastic. Uh, so we have a number of good things uh, going on. And then I'm actually in 48 minutes, <laughs> I'm gonna be at a press conference announcing, and I can tell, I can give you the 40, 48 minute sneak preview. The bill's in print, so it's not really a secret anymore. Uh, yesterday, um, on the first day of our legislative session, the first bill I introduced was Senate Bill 4. Uh, SB 4 allows uh, churches and other religious institutions, as well as nonprofit colleges, uh, to build 100% affordable housing on their excess land whether that might be a parking lot that's too big or other excess land, uh, it automatically rezones it for the appropriate density to support affordable housing and automatically approves the project. So no uh, five-year local permitting uh, process. Uh, there, there was uh, um, an analysis done a few years ago by the Turner Center looking at the largest uh, counties in the state, uh, showing that just in those large counties, uh, about almost 40,000 acres of land uh, will be unlocked just from the religious institutions dedicated only to affordable housing. So it could be a real game changer. Uh, there are even in, even in little tiny little San Francisco, uh, we have a whole bunch of uh, churches that um, have extra land and want to build housing, but it's too hard. Uh, so this will help facilitate that. And then I also just want to um, mention uh, you know, a few over the last few years, we've done a lot of work in the legislature to put some real teeth into various state housing laws, but in particular, the requirement that cities plan for enough housing for the future, um, what we call the housing element, where the city has to come up with a blueprint for the next eight years to accommodate the uh, regional housing needs allocation, the housing goals that have been set for them. I authored a law that um, dramatically increased what those numbers will be because they were too low before. So San Francisco's uh, number for the next eight years has increased from about 28,000 to about uh, low, I think 81,000, so about tripling. Um, and then uh, there's now teeth in that. Uh, the city has to create a real plan, which is happening now. Um, no more gamesmanship, no more fake plans. Uh, and so it's a it's an awkward and, and difficult political transition, but it's incredibly important and we're gonna it's gonna I think help get us to a better space. Um, so um, I'll, I'll leave it there. Um, uh, we're gonna continue to do that work. Uh, I know the mayor and the board of Supervisors will continue to do that work in City Hall. And I know that uh, you all and the other amazing nonprofits out there will continue to do the work on the ground to get people housed. So thank you so much. So thank you, uh, Senator. I know that there may be a few questions, uh, but first we want to make sure that we say we're glad that you're safe. Read the news today about the bomb threat. Um, I know that whether it is folks on the far right like Charlie Kirk or others, um, and the back and forth that you have with some of your contemporaries in the Senate, like Senator Green, uh, we're very happy that you are safe and that you are okay. So we want to make sure Thank that you. we start. I appreciate you. that. Thank you. Absolutely. Um, Senator, I was hoping that you could tell us a, a little bit about 
Is there anything you are most proud of in 2022? Anything that you'd like to speak a little bit more in depth about or let folks know that people may not be aware of because all of these bills that take place, it's almost impossible to keep up with everything. Is there anything that you're really, really proud of that you want to take time to share with folks? Yeah, well, I'm proud that we got AB 2011 by Assemblymember Wicks passed. I think that could be a, a real game changer and had a great coalition. And the, and the Carpenters Union has now gotten much more involved, which has been productive. Um, I also authored um, a student housing bill, SB 886, that was signed into law um, it's that, that allows UC, CSU, and community colleges to build on-campus student and staff housing um, without having to go through CEQA. Um, it takes, it's way too hard for them to build housing. We know that rates of homelessness among college students are really high. Uh, and so uh, that was something that we're uh, really proud of. Uh, we reauthorized um, the uh, um, um, Project Home Key. Uh, the governor's, uh, 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 um, you know, his uh, ch child, <laughs> legislative child, uh, allowing for the conversion of motels, et cetera, uh, into permanent supportive housing. Uh, so we, we had a good year in a number of respects. And that's absolutely fantastic. As we get into 2023, it's hard to imagine that we're only a few weeks away from the start of the new year. I know you talked a little bit about your legislative agenda. When, if you could sort of wave a magic wand, thinking about the first thing that you'd want to happen come January 1st of 2023, that you knew would provide deliverables to your constituents and the folks here in San Francisco, what, what would that be? What would that one magic wand be if come January 1st, you could just make something happen? Because um, I know you do a lot of hard work, you and your colleagues. Yeah. Uh, what would that look like? I mean, it's just making it really, really, really fast to create new housing. It's just, it's such a basic need and we've made it so hard. And it's, you know, it was not out of malice or ill will. It was just a series of policy decisions over decades that each individually had a rationale for it, but in combination to made it difficult to impossible to build much housing. Uh, and it's so badly harmed our state in terms of homelessness, but also in terms of uh, pushing out the middle class and pushing people on the long commutes and uh, making it hard for our, our neighborhood businesses to hire people because uh, people working in retail or, or, the, or the food service sector can't afford to live anywhere close by and they don't want to have that long commute. So that's what I would do if I could wave my magic wand. That, that is fantastic. Thinking about December 21st being Homeless Persons Memorial Day um, and remembering the lives that have been lost of the unhoused community, like you said, based on systemic policies, based on the lack of affordable housing, based on the inability to construct and get people in homes. Um, can you talk to us a little bit about the importance of that day and why it's important that we take time to remember the folks that have lost their lives in the fight against homelessness? Yeah, I mean, it, it's important to remember because it's a complete tragedy, but what's even worse is it's an, an, an avoidable tragedy uh, that our, our, our failure to, to really have a safety net that allows folks who are struggling to be housed and to have the services that they need is, is the reason why these people are, 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 are dying at, at outrageous uh, rates. Uh, and, and it's not it's not rocket science. It's it's about committing to a, a safety net. Uh, we used to build public housing in this country. We used to have SROs that were affordable. We had options for people who were uh, struggling and people who had mental health problems or just were living in extreme poverty. And now those people are pushed onto the streets and they spiral towards death. And it's it's just an avoidable tragedy. We absolutely, we really, really appreciate you you mentioning that and, and speaking to that. Um, if I could ask, because I've never been a legislator and for the amazing folks here at Compass and then some of our community partners and clients that are here, can, can you talk a little bit about outside of nonprofits that are doing this work, is there anything that the average person can do? Is there civic engagement that you wish more people would rally behind or get involved with. Can you talk to us about ways people can get involved that yeah. don't work at nonprofits? 
<laughs> well, I mean, people people can certainly volunteer in nonprofits or support nonprofits financially. Um, that's valuable. Um, people also should get involved in housing activism. I'm a supporter of the YIMBY movement, which has uh, been created over the last decade, which is just people who want to build more housing of all types, ranging from supportive housing to workforce housing, to market rate housing, to accessory dwelling units, to student housing and senior housing, just everything. And they advocate to remove the barriers that are holding us back. And so that's um, a good um, outlet for uh, for activism. Um, and then also, you know, I mean, I, mean, I don't want to get political, but, but people should pay attention to who is in elected office, who is running for elected office. Make sure you know where people stand and just don't assume just because someone's saying the right things that they're going to do the right thing. And you have to look at what people are actually have done and are doing uh, and make sure you're voting for people who are going to take these problems as seriously as they should be taken. Absolutely, that that is great advice. And I, I'm sure that the folks that are listening and watching us, I hope they take heed to that because that civic engagement is so, so important. Um, if, if I could ask, because again, not being a legislator, um, having taken a civics course in a very, very long time, um, what, are some difficulties of your job that people just don't know? What are some things that you would assume people would know because we'd hope that everyone would be civically engaged and they paid attention in high school and college or middle school, but what are some of the, the pitfalls of your job that people will never know as you are fighting the good fight? Well, I mean, there, there are a lot of times when people say, oh, we should, we should just do this. We should change state law to do this. And sometimes it seems very straightforward. It's never straightforward. There are bills that I have that like, I, I would think would have no opposition, seem like just a simple, easy thing that I'm not going to have to spend much time on. And California is such a large, complex state that all of a sudden opposition materializes in groups that you never even thought of before or heard of before. And so everything that you propose, there, there are going to be stakeholders that have opinions uh, about it. Uh, and, and, and so it's just the complexity of what we do, even for things that seem easy, um, it's always more complex than you think. Uh, also, of course, we are very progressive in San Francisco and in, in, in the bulk of the Bay Area. Uh, but this is a big state. And even among Democrats, there's a lot of diversity. And so there are times when uh, ideas that are very no-brainers in San Francisco or Oakland or West LA uh, are quite controversial um, uh, statewide. The other thing I just want to uh, point out, and you, you sort of, and thank you for referencing this at, at, the, at the, the beginning about the bomb threat that I had at my home uh, this morning, and I get a lot of death threats because of the work I do for the LGBTQ uh, community. Um, political threats and violence are are surging in this country. And I think you know that you, these are, I know you are all engaged in watching what's going on and it's getting, it's getting worse. And you look at what's happening, you know, in, in Columbus, Ohio over the weekend, you know, Nazis marching and shutting down a, a church that was putting on a holiday drag performance. Um, and that's happening all over the place and, and towards the LGBTQ community, but also towards Jews, um, towards immigrants. It's a really scary time. And, you know, our former president helped unleash it. And, but he's, he's only the most extreme version. It's really infecting right-wing politics and brainwashing a lot of people. And there, there's a lot of risk that we face as a society and it's risk of violence too. And so it's, and we get that, I get that directed, but other elected officials do as well. Um, but it's also towards various folks in the community who are being targeted and harassed. And it's just important for people to, to be mindful of that and always know that that is happening. Yeah, uh, it, it's absolutely so unfortunate. And obviously we're happy that you're safe. I know this, it, it's it's so odd to say that this isn't the first bomb threat that you received and that that's such a scary thing this time. And not to be political, um, because I, I wanna make sure that we are bipartisan, but for, for you, how is it that you contend and do your best to work with folks that Twitter is a public platform and we can see the way folks are homophobic, they, they, espouse bigotry and anti-Semitism and just hatred. 
And I, I think what you could speak to is a, a larger sort of uh, microcosm to any workplace. How do you navigate working in spaces where you know people don't have your best interests? Um, and it's not about the ideals, it's about your humanity. Yeah, I'll be, I'll be honest that it's, it's really hard when you have people questioning, you know, the humanity of other human beings, or questioning the humanity and, and, uh, and, and, you know, just, you're trying to erase people. It's very uh, disheartening. And in the work that I do in particular, you know, hey, listen, I, I'm a grown up, I'm, I, I'm in San Francisco politics, I have thick skin, I, I can, it's hard, but I can navigate things. But I, you know, these atta the attacks on me are not just about me, it's because of the work that we're doing, particularly to support LGBTQ young people. And so these kids, these kids, these are children, teenagers, they see what's going on. You know, these kids who are LGBTQ who are trans, they, they, they see what's going on. And you just imagine what impact that has on them when they see that they've become political footballs, that they're politicians who are actually trying to build their political career on these kids backs by disparaging these kids and these kids and demonizing them and threatening to put their parents in prison uh and is it any wonder that the suicide rates among these kids are as high as they are so i try to always focus on the the people that we're trying to help and the people whose lives are being saved because of work that we do just like you save lives in the work that you do. And I just focus on that and that's how I get through it. Well, it's definitely, we commend you for the work that you're doing. Um, it, no one should face death threats or the harm or fear of violence going to work. Um, that, that's, that's just terrible. So again, we are, we are so appreciative that you are okay and that you are standing fighting the good fight. Um, before I turn it over, because I do know there are some folks here that would love to ask questions. I'd love to know, do you have, if you could give us maybe three tips or three pieces of wisdom or advice for just workplace conflict in general, because you deal with it at the highest level. And you seem to always be above reproach. And, and even in your answer, even though you may personally feel different about the way people attack you, is there any advice that you could give or three tips for folks like, hey, if you're navigating workplace conflict, this is what I would encourage you to do? Yeah, I mean, first of all, try, just staying focused and not getting distracted by people who are saying or doing horrible things. I know it's hard, but we're trying to stay focused. Uh, not, not losing not losing your cool, um, just stay, taking deep breaths and staying focused even when people are acting in really bad uh, ways. And it's just always remembering why you're doing the work and, and just keeping that in mind. I, I really love those points. I especially love your last point, sort of what's your why and the why it is behind the things that you do. Uh, I think that is so incredibly important. Um, and I know that your time is limited. I know that you have to get ready to go to City Hall to, to, to do some things. So I want to open it up for our, our colleagues that are here. Um, obviously folks, we're excited to have you and we're so appreciative of you and your staff for your time. Um, is there anyone that would like to come off mute and potentially ask a question? Um, I can monitor the chat as well, but is there anyone that would like to come off mute and ask a question? I know the good folks at Compass are not shy. <laughs> Going once. <laughs> Going twice. I have a question. I don't know if it's... Uh, I'm, it, it, oh, Jackie. Hello. There we go. I'm sorry. Hello. Uh, this question kind of expands outside of San Francisco. I know you're based in San Francisco, so let me know if this question doesn't match this uh, setting and then I'll just park it and <laughs> direct it somewhere else. So um, seeing that housing is a crisis throughout... Can you hear me? Is that better? Seeing, yeah. that, <laughs> seeing that housing is a crisis throughout the entire state, do you see it opening up in more than San Francisco? In, um, in California, um, like a lot of people are displaced from San Francisco to Antioch. So um, do you see a significant amount of housing opening up yeah. in some of the more popular Bay Area cities or larger yeah. uh, Bay Area cities as well? Yeah, absolutely. And, and it's, really, it's a really important question because 
you know, no city is going to solve the housing crisis on their own. We're all interconnected, the entire Bay Area and the whole state. Um, and so we, we, that's why the work that we do is statewide and regional. Uh, and we're seeing positive impacts from some of these state laws, not just in San Francisco, but in the East Bay, in Silicon Valley, and the North Bay, and in Tahoe, and in LA, in San Diego. It's, it's really all, all over the place. And it has to be uh, because uh, we're, we don't live in a vacuum. We're so interconnected. Our economies are, um, our housing market is. And so that's a really important question. So the answer is yes. I have another question. I'm sorry. And I, th I did see that there was another hand. So I'm thinking about too, also with um, population shifts, how people will come from another state to California because there are more resources or how some people just feel like it's better to go to another state from California. Do you see a, um, or can you tell us a little bit about how um, there might be a control on that so that we don't absorb a lot of people? Or, well, we already have this so that we're not absorbing as much or so much. I mean, for the population shift, is there a conversation with other poorer uh, regions that might be help uh, helpful for them to um, to gain some tools or equipment to increase their housing. So I guess it's a two part question. Um, is there some type of control that goes in with uh, population shifts for people who are saying I'm I'm going to move from Pennsylvania to California or something like that? And is there a conversation on the table for poorer or um, you know other regions to kind of get acclimated to help their um their residents their populations well i mean the the second one first we want to we want all cities and states to be able to you know have the investment and uh be able to you know grow and 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 and, and, and move forward so yes in terms of population shifts i mean to, to be clear the government we don't government doesn't have a role in deciding where people move or don't move, nor should we. People should be able to move wherever they want to move. And the history of humanity forever is that people move around. Not everyone, but, but people move around. And people decide whether it's my family who left, fled from Eastern Europe and, and came to this country and to Pennsylvania <laughs> uh, be, because of um, their villages getting burned down in Eastern Europe or uh, migrants from Mexico or Central America coming here for economic opportunity, or, or, or people moving from you know, the Midwest to San Francisco or to LA or to Miami or wherever else because they sense that there's economic opportunity there. That's the history of this. Or Oklahoma people moving during the Dust Bowl from Oklahoma to California, which is it's huge, just it huge has migration. Thing and you this. Or, um, the, a huge migration. Uh, and so I think the minute the government starts stepping in to try to control where people move to or don't move to, I think we're asking for trouble. Um, the goal is to try to anticipate where the population trends are and to plan for it. And we've done that very poorly in recent years. Jackie, thank you for your questions. Um, Senator, next I want to go to Chad Dyer, who is the director of the board at Compass. He's the president of the board. I'm sorry. So, Chad, I'm going to throw it over to you. Well, thanks. Um, and thanks, Rhett, for this awesome uh, initiative of the Inclusion Talk series. I think this is a really cool thing um, that you put together. Um, uh, and Senator Weider, also sending my regards on behalf of Erica Kish, who is uh, is taking care of her elderly parents and is disappointed she couldn't join today. Um, I know you know her. Um, and so I have two questions you can pick, you can pick or do both or, or pick and choose. So one is um, one of the you know important things that Compass does in terms of services is, is mental health services. And I know this has been a legislative priority of yours as well. So you might talk about the, you know, any of that that you want to highlight or the role of sort of mental health accessibility um, as it pertains to, you know, homelessness or just, just in general. So that's one question. Second question is, and you, you alluded to it a little bit before, but, you know, California is, uh, you know, democratic control of, of, you know, all the, all the, big offices um, and yet like, and also sort of, I think has a self image as being really progressive and like wanting to help people that are typically you know, not uh, prioritized in sort of our, our distribution of resources in society. And so talk about to what do you attribute the fact that our progressive ideals don't necessarily match our outcomes in California in spite of the fact that sort of we kind of ostensibly kind of have control, um, you know, there's not like we're fighting off, you know, 
a lot of like right wing conservative control yeah. of things. So how do you, how do you, how do you balance this? So either of those, take your pick. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so uh, in terms of mental health, that's been a high priority for me and, and for the legislature and the governor. I've, I've authored a few uh, laws to try to force insurance companies to cover more mental health services and particularly prevention and early intervention instead of just only covering treatment when someone's already in crisis. We want to avoid people getting into crisis. We've also done work to try to help our most debilitated residents, people on our streets who are unable to make decisions for themselves and who are quickly spiraling towards death because of severe untreated mental health and addiction, uh, to, to try to get them help and if necessary through conservatorships uh, where the county sort of temporarily makes decisions for them to try to get them stabilized uh, with the hope of getting them out of the conservatorship and on, onto a better uh, life. Uh, so in a number of ways, we're trying to improve mental health access in, in uh, California. In terms of uh, sort of progressivism, you know, California is a very progressive state in a number of ways, but not in others. Uh, and there are times when California is not as progressive as people think. It is a large, complicated state. Even though it's a very blue state at this point, uh, there's a lot of divisions among Democrats. There are, you know, in terms of whether communities that are very democratic but don't don't want new housing, uh, or um, uh, people who don't want to, you know, pay more taxes in, in this, that, or the other uh, area, or um, around, you know, crime and public safety, there are some uh, divisions, and so. We're still a very diverse state politically, even though it's, you know, we're the, the, even though the Democratic Party is completely dominant here. Uh, and so that's, um, you know, it's it's just how California is. Excellent, Chad. Wonderful question. We have one chested question in the chat center that I want to get to. And I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name, Sunil. Um, I'm sorry if I mispronounce your name. The question is, how important is it to strengthen technically and financially the community housing providers to deliver social and affordable housing? Uh, I'm not sure I understand that. I, I, let me read it one more time. And Sunil, I'm sorry if I am not interpreting your question correctly. How important is it to strengthen technically and financially the community housing providers to deliver social and affordable housing? Um, I, I would say it's important to strengthen the organizations and to make sure that they are um, technically um, skills at what they're doing. And I think a lot of the organizations that are doing the work are very, very skilled. So yeah, that's very uh, important. Thank you so much, Senator. We want to be respectful of your time. Yeah. We want to end one minute early. Um, on behalf yeah. of Compass Family Services, our CEO, our board, uh, we're so appreciative of you, the work that you're doing. Keep up the good fight. Everyone, I hope that you have a fantastic day. Um, and we are behind you, Senator, supporting you. Thank you. Have a good one, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye, everybody.